I can see right up your shorts, babe. Down. There you go. If I can't see your face, though. There you go. Perfect. Perfect. Mr. Jamie Jukes, nice lampshade. Hit me. So, so how are yeah. you? You know what, Phil? I'm in the best place I've been in a long time. Good. And, and lockdown for me, um, out of it being such a um, scary and negative thing for people, <coughs> it out of such a hard time has come such creativity for me. And I have found my kind of calling at this point into bring some joy, use use some of the wonderful people I know and be able to give them a job at, in terms of West End Workshops Live and I just kind of, it just keeps me busy and you know for so long I've been in my own lockdown so lockdown's no different for me <laughs> um, so yeah so let's start like... right at the beginning so you you live on the Isle of Wight at the moment, don't you, with your family? Yeah. And that's where you were brought yes, up? I do. That's where I was brought up, yeah. So you, were you born there? Yeah. Wow. So how I did... Born there. So I've been, and I've seen you perform over there. So it's that theatre that you went to as a kid. Do I remember that right? Absolutely correct. That's, that's where I did Oliver. I played Oliver at the age of 11, and it's where I did all my first shows. And your parents are quite... Because your dad is a musician... Yes, my dad is in a band with, this is brilliant, you'll love this, Millie O'Connell's dad. No way! This is brilliant, actually. And and we auditioned for Soho Cinders together. I was for Luke Bayer's part. Yeah, Robbie. Part. <clears throat> and we auditioned together, and we were like, our dads are in the band together, because she lives on the island too. I never knew this! Good bit of information. He is the drummer, my dad's the singer. Oh, amazing. So how long have they been in a band together? For about um, seven years. Wow. So it's how... a nice little stagey connection there. Yeah. Well, how old is Millie compared to you? I have no idea, but I never knew of her. Right. She's like 24. Um, I never knew she existed because when I... <clears throat> when I... I left... Uh, the Isle of Wight at the age of 16 so I was out of the loop of the Isle yeah, yeah, of yeah. the age of 16 so I went to boarding school at train so, okay yeah so yeah so then how did that come out so you went you left the island did you know then that you wanted to get into performing oh my god yeah I was rubbish I was so rubbish at school and I was awful and I just used to be in goal in PE, and I used to be like, "Come on, babe, why don't we?" Sh- oh, I've got to get the ball. You know, I literally was doing, and that is the story I've told for ages. Like, I was doing all that jazz in goal, seriously. <laughs> like, I'm not joking. And you know, I got bullied really badly, like yeah. <coughs> really badly. And I was the problem is my academia was so bad. Like, I was in set eight for like maths and stuff. And the problem with that was. I was with people that were quite scary and chavy, let's say. Yeah. Um, so it meant I, I got bullied a lot. And you know, you're girly. I mean, I didn't get physically bullied, but I had loads of, you're girly, you're this, you're that. And, and did you know, it bother you bullied. or did it kind of make you want to change or did you just rise above it? I don't know. When I was younger, I think I was quite blind to it. I just, I just thought that was my life now and I didn't know who I was and I just... I wasn't very deep. I was yeah. just kind of crossing along and finding light in any situation I could. And my light was stagecoach on a Saturday and a Sunday, and they were my friends. So yeah. school wasn't my light. It was my, my dark place where I would just only live for drama. Um, and then, yeah. And how were your parents at that point? Were they kind of encouraging of you doing the arts and... They, yeah, my mum dragged me kicking and screaming to stagecoach at the age of 10. 
my friend who actually sadly passed away, um, she was my best friend, <coughs> she got me into it. And I just loved it. But I was so unconfident as a child. I was quiet. I know, you can't believe that. <laughs> um, and I was chubby. I was a little chubby baby. And I just went. And it was like, I'd always been obsessed with Disney. I'd always loved Disney films. I loved watching Chitty Chitty Bang Bang. And I'm, I'm still obsessed with things, not just theatre, but I get obsessed with things. I don't know if you notice, but I was obsessed with watching something over and over and over again so and that's how I got into it and I I loved it I absolutely loved it and I, I just felt like oh this is this is who I am now this is this is good but how much access did you have so growing up on the island why obviously there is a theatre but what type of productions did they put on so they call it semi-professional so they do like summer seasons. So it's like the old kind of. I love a summer season. Like, I don't know if you, you know about this. Yeah. But, like the old so when people wouldn't go to our vapor, they would go to places in the UK. Bridlington still does a fabulous summer season. Yeah. And that is Alex. Alex, who I worked with on the Cardo, his husband or boyfriend he owns a theatre they do a fantastic summer season and I think we're missing that we don't have the money or the people coming to holiday in England yeah. for that to work so yeah it was summer seasons I worked in the summer seasons on the island <clears throat> and then so you got into GSA when you were 18 18 but I'd been to Art said Tring right age 16 to 18 um and what made you go for GSA? I went to GSA because I got into all the schools I went for. Um, I'm not bigging myself up, but I did. And the reason I did get in was because I went to Arts Ed Tring and they gave me the start. But um, yeah. I didn't want to go to Arts Ed Chizik because I was put off because there were loads of kids running around. And that was it. Like, I was just like, eh. In hindsight, I probably should have gone to Arts Ed Chizik because it's fantastic and I would be a better dancer. Mountview, I hated Wood Green, and that's it. I, I hated it. I was yeah. in the Morrisons. Do you, you kind of have this map, and you're you're going through Morrisons and Wood Green, and it, it was grim. And I went. To, sorry, don't put that in. I went <laughs> to um, I went to Guildford, and I was like, and and the thing is, every other audition, they're really clever, Guildford, because they, it was a whole weekend. Every other audition was just a day, right. half a day. But I knew, like, I was like, how can I verify, like, I'm going to pick Mountview over Guildford if I don't know as much about it. Yeah. I was there for a weekend. I slept in the YMCA. I got to know people. I was like, there's no competition. And Guildford's there. No, so the Isle of Wight's there. Guildford's there. And London's there. So it felt like a st the stepping stone I needed to kind of be like, I'm not going to London yet, but I'm halfway there. And it's nice. Yeah. And did it feel like that? Did it feel like home when you got there? Guildford? Yeah. Oh, my God. Absolutely. Because it's a beautiful Guildford, city, isn't it? Oh, my God. It's stunning. And I'm very much like, because there's a new building, <clears throat> and we weren't the new building. Actually, in our third year, the new building was made. And, and the new building's great, but if you gone to GSA like the Daniel Boys is and the you know all of these people will know what that's like and how wonderful it was just turning up in a random church hall yeah. do you know what I mean just being like you know and, and walking around the city and, and, and having to go here there and everywhere it was the charm and when the new building came in the third year it's fantastic if you arrive you would be like oh my god I'm at fame but for someone that had the heart of the college I missed I missed the old DSA. Yeah. Um, and I still do, but I think the new building is fantastic. So yeah. who was there when you were there? Either like the years above you or in your year? Notable. So one one of the best performers I think in the industry is Louis Maskell, who was in the Green Man. Yeah. He was one of my closest really close friends. And he's one of these people that's fascinating because he will not take anything. Right. He's, pro I think, he won't mind me saying that he's been offered like Fiero, yeah, offered Mamiya, and he's, he turns them down. But 
bit, he waits for things like The Grinning Man, and when he does stuff like The Grinning Man, you're like, ah, mm, I see why. And Flowers for Mrs. Harris. Did you see that? It's online <laughs> yeah. at the moment. Yeah. Have you seen yeah. it? Yeah, amazing. Isn't it? And what, and what he does, what he does is, he just kind of, he let's say he hides away, and um, he just comes out at these kind of amazing moments. Yeah. Um, and and just kind of arrives, and you're just like, wow, do you know what I mean? He's, he's amazing. So, yeah. So... When you after you graduate, one of your first main productions was with Paul Taylor Mills. Yeah, I, it was. But <clears throat> my first, my first thing was HMS Pinafore at the King's Head um, with Drew Baker. No way! And, um, directed Pirate Queen. Yeah. yeah. And how many people were in I that? With a guy called... What's that? How many people were in that? <clears throat> about 12, I think. Uh, hi, I'm Phil Marriott. Uh, I'm playing Captain Corcoran in uh, HMS Pinafore at the Embassy Barge. It's all going well. Uh, a lot to take in, but it's uh, I'm like a sponge. You know, I'm a sponge. Yeah, still eating fruit. It's all good. My oh, what was that? And uh, I'm ensemble and cover rain, and you all have got to see each other before. It's going to be a great show, and you get to see us. On one show. We started the wow. barge as you did then. Actually, I don't see the Battersea barge being used as much these days, which I find interesting. Yeah, I think it sank. Is. I'm kidding. <laughs> yes, I think it's serious. Yeah, why is that, Phil? Why isn't it used as much these days? I don't know, because I agree. Like, there was a lot of stuff. There used to be regular cabarets. I think it's just location. It was regular, so difficult to get to. and I mean, it was it was great to hire there because it was, now. it was cheaper. But, yeah, I don't know. Maybe. So, you, you, you started at the barge. 12 people on that tiny little stage. That's impressive. Maybe that's... No, it was about that, yeah. We yeah. Were and we, uh, yeah, so it was great. I mean, it was great. It was just... It was my first kind of... You know, it's a profit share. And profit shares back in the day, I don't know if you might... Profit share was profit share. Like, yeah. it was... You know, I, I think there's something now in place where you actually get some money. But, I mean, profit share w was, was essentially working for absolutely free. Yeah. And that's not a bad thing. I'm not slagging it off. And I think a lot of my agents have said, you know, if you need to do it, if you need to do some profiling. And you've even, when I've been out of work, you sent me, oh, Jamie, uh, which has been great. I think you sent me an audition for Xanadu. Or like, you, yeah. said, you should do this. And I think if the part is right for you, oh, my God, absolutely do it. Um, and if you can afford it, I simply can't afford it most of the time. So I'm not slagging it off. If I could do... You know, some. I mean, it's not the same. But if I if I could do these things, I would love to. I'd love to do. You know, years ago, do fix at the union. But I just at the time, I I, I would have been so far in my overdraft. Yeah. So yeah. It's finding that balance of, like you say, picking the right project, and it's hard. It is hard to yeah. gauge which is which is going to be beneficial to you. But um. Yeah. But yeah, so you did yeah. that, and then it... I went on the ship after that. Oh. Was this the ship that you yeah. were meant to go back on recently? Yes, yeah, this was the ship. I was kind of, I've been really toying with, <clears throat> until lockdown, I was going in a frenzy of, I just need to do something, because yeah. I was in, which we'll come on to later, but I was in such a bad place. And I was just like, I want to do something, and I want to run away. Obviously, a ship, you're running away. Yeah. It's brilliant. You can get away earn lots of money and take pictures for Instagram in the sun. Um, <laughs> but you obviously had a good experience of it the first time round. I did. I, yeah. Yeah, I learned so much and I championed ships and I had to sing opera. I had to, I had to sing, I had to learn 12 different shows in a couple of weeks. Now, if you, you know, if, if you know what that's like, then you know it, it sets you up and, and 
the stigma with cruises isn't the same anymore. They do full scale shows, and it's just yeah. amazing. And I, you know, you, you being one of them, you can see people post on Instagram, and you feel you must be like you, Jammy Dodger. No, I know there's a there is a difference because people it can be quite isolating, but you have to kind of benefit take it for what it is and like if see it as an opportunity it's an opportunity to, yeah. to be away and get this experience and go to these locations and if it's what you want and you're in the right frame of mind it is perfect but I can see the flip side to it where if sometimes people need grounding and they need people around them or kind of consistency and for them it wouldn't work but then like that's like anything that's the difference between working in town and working on tour, and you'll know about this. It's like sometimes people, you can. It's a flip of a coin. You can decide whether yeah. you're enjoying it one day or the next. Yeah, and I think that I think at that time I was getting to the finals for everything, and it was just like it's that old saying. You could write it in in the, the actor's book of like leaving college it's that old saying of, and I understand it you don't have enough credits yeah but and then you're thinking to yourself how if you don't give me a chance yeah how am I going to get credits so you're in this battle and it's really tough and for your mental health at that time I don't think I realised that the pressure you put under yourself is so difficult and I was just like I want to sing and get paid for it yeah. So I'm going to go for this audition and, and do it. And I think it is starting to change. The, the recent years of like Jack Yarrow and Sam Tutty coming straight out of college and kind of really kind of being pushed and encouraged and celebrated for like coming through. It kind of does. Sorry, what it. do you mean about Jack Yarrow and Sam Tutty? So did, did they do a cruise? What no, I'm mean? saying like coming straight out of college and like being offered those oh, opportunities right. yeah. without any experience. Sorry. Like I say, there's, there's yeah. no pressure. there was no pressure on either of them to be like, you haven't got enough credits, you've not got enough experience. The industry yeah. is starting to, and I think it's down to the industry, and it's the casting directors and the audience. People are allowing fresh talent to come through, and that's brilliant. I think, I, you know, I think Cameron McIntosh, I know he, he wasn't um, Joseph, but... I know, you know, it's that thing with um, Charlie Stemp. Yeah, with, um, yeah. He, I don't know if he was fresh from college, but it, it's about launching someone and it's about having that... But making a star. ...more interesting for people because they're like, hang on a minute, you've got... This, we want to know who this is. It's not like, oh, you've got Sheridan Smith. Oh, yeah, Sheridan Smith, great, amazing. We'll go and see it. It's like, ooh, I'm intrigued now. Who have you got? You know, I think that's that, that that's it, it's clever because they've got this nice looking guy. He's really talented, and you just want to know about him. It, it, you're intrigued by, okay, you've made the decision to put an unknown in lead. So, okay, give it to us. What what what, what are you going to do to the part, and 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 why have you you got it? And people actually want to see that person because they're like, oh they must be bloody good because they haven't got it because they're from Big Brother. Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Exactly. So I think it's I think it's a new thing that started. I think Cameron Mattel started it really well and it puts these people on the map. Jack Yarrow, a lovely looking guy, perfect for Joseph when people thought that maybe Ollie Merz was going to get it. Yeah. And that's fine, but it would have made it a different production. You've got Sheridan Smith, you've got Jason Donovan, have a singer that's going to come on there and do his craft fresh from our set, perfect. And then came away with an Olivier nod, so proved it. So yeah, but yeah, Absolutely. so so go back. So you did the cruise, you enjoyed it, and then you came back, and then is that when Rent came about? Yeah, straight away, straight away. Yeah, I, I kind of like got into the gym and um, met te met Paul Taylor Mills. We used to go to the same gym. <laughs> I remember this because I went to the, it was fitness first, wasn't it? We all yeah. went to the same gym. <laughs> we all went to the same gym <laughs> in Covent Garden. I'm gonna, I'm gonna put my hands up like I stalked 
stalked him for that show. Like, I saw it come up, and I was like, this is big. This is going to be big as Profit Share goes. So this was a production that they did at Greenwich with Zoe Burkett and Jamie Burkett and... Steph Thera. Yeah. And Gary Wood. Yes. Yeah. It was, um... Yeah, it... I just, I just had been thinking. I was like, I knew they'd done um, that bloody rent live, and or whatever it was, and I'm sure that was great. But I never, it hadn't been done in no. England that much. Um, and he, it, it just flashed up on Facebook. I come back off the ship, and I was like, I'm gagging. I want to do this because I was really getting to know my sexuality. I was having fun with me being in London and I kind of wanted to be like, I want to reflect this in the show that I'm doing. And I thought, what an amazing way to kind of let go of my college years and how structured I should be and do a profit share, <laughs> have no money really at the end of it, but just have the best time. And I loved it. I got to take my kit off, I danced with Natalie McQueen, who went on to do amazing things, and it was just a hoot, and people from that show have done incredible things. But this was I one of the show. This, this was one of the few shows that Paul directed before he went on to mainly produce, and he's done a little bit recently, but yeah, so what was he like as a director? He was very kind. Yeah? Very kind. And he is another person. And, and working with the West End Workshop thing, you realise people that work from business and people that work from the heart. And he was a producer and a director. Or Kylie Bitkins was working with him at that, that, with yeah. him at that point. But he did this thing this day, and he was like, I want you to bring in a picture of someone that you love. And he lit loads of candles. And we all had to tell, write a story to this person of so it's it was it was kind of going will i lose my dignity yeah someone there? it was bringing that to life because that song <clears throat> is one of the most special moments in the show yeah um and we all just like told our stories and no one was doing like oh my god you know at college like, oh, god, man. it was all very sincere and it was calm and it felt safe and he created that environment so i'll thank him forever for giving me that experience of having time we had time to do that we weren't doing joseph and getting out in a week <laughs> and then was yeah. it later after that you went to germany yeah so germany well, i did joseph first so, so you did Joseph, Joseph first. Joseph was, Joseph was like, I'll kind of like leave out, you know. You. Joseph was like the next big thing. I swear that was the big thing. And and I was working at Harrods and hating my life. And I was yes. thinking about working my way out at Harrods. And I was like, what's the point? It was my third time auditioning. And um, So this was the Bill Kenwright's the touring production? Yes, the Bill Kenwright's UK tour. Um, they auditioned me for Dreamboats and Petticoats. And they were like, you're rubbish. Like, you're just not right for them. So I was like, thank you. Um, and they said, but come back tomorrow and audition for Joseph. And I was like, okay, cool. I auditioned on the Monday, saw Bill on the Friday, started the job on the Monday, and that was it. And yeah. Bill was directing it himself, Twilight wasn't he? Forever. No, well, he is the director, but he was the original director and then he comes in at the end and says, right. do this, do that. And Henry Metcalf is the resident director. Right. But he is resident in more than resident because he does rehearsals. And stuff. Yeah. yeah. And then how many times have you gone on to do it now? I've lost count. So I've done four <laughs> different contracts. I did it with Lloyd Daniels, Jamie Hensley, and Joe McEldry. I did it twice with Lloyd Daniels, once with Joe McEldry, and once with Jamie Hensley. I've probably done the show about a thousand times or more. I, I really don't know. And were you now, always the same brother? No, no. With each, with each contract came a different challenge. So the first one was my first contract and I ended up second cover Joseph. Ooh. My second one, what did I get in that? 
I went on for Joseph in my second contract. That was it. In my third contract, I was dance captain. Lol. <laughs> um, and I became second cover narrator. Lol. Um, and then on my fourth contract, I was swing. So I was learning something I'd never learned before. And I was emergency cover Jacob. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Did you ever go on for Jacob and a narrator? No. No. I never went on for the narrator. I never went on for Jacob, which Jacob never happened. But I've 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 done a cover run of the narrator. And it's fab, but I've I've been on it, Joseph. And how was that? That first time. Incredible. Um, and where was it? Where was that at the point? Swindon. Swindon. And um, Lloyd just hurt his back, and the first cover, Matt Brinkler, who you will know well, was yes. the first cover at the time. Um, and he just was vocally tired and we had a real, like, I think other company managers would be like, carry on, carry on. But she was just like, no, we've got a second cover, get him on. Yeah. And I just did it. And it, it was, it was so surreal because I found out in between shows. So I had an hour to compose myself. I put on a bit of fake tan. Um, <laughs> you know what I mean? I put him in a picture. Did you sit up? And I thought to myself, the best thing you can think in this situation is, Phil, and this is my advice to lots of performers is, before this curtain opens, right now, I've done everything I can. Yeah. Let's not think, let's do and see what happens. Because if we start thinking, that's when problems happen. But were you excited? Were you, were you? Was it a dream come true? Just did like I am massive. Joseph. Massive, massive, lifelong, everything I'd worked for. Um, I cried a lot. Um, I, you know, I, I signed autographs for the first time in my life, and it was so special. And the feedback was lovely. And there are some parts in the West End that you do auditions you go for and that character is within you it's in your blood yeah and joseph is one of those that's it so then keep it with joseph you did bring it home by doing it <laughs> on the isle of Y. so how did that come about and was that how did that feel so tell us about that well, we can talk about my mental health later. Yeah, we'll come back to that. It stemmed, it stemmed from it stemmed from being at home because I was, let's say, poorly. Yeah, I was poorly, um, and I lost confidence. And my friend Tony just said to me, like he, he was lovely, and he just said, "Hi." Um, I, I I went up. He said that they were doing the local Amdram group, who were amazing. I mean, Amdram groups, as we know. They ain't what they used to be. My God, their budgets are ridiculous. And he, I said to him, oh, I'd, you know, for my confidence, I'd love to help out. Like, I'd love to, like, you know, be there and, and help out if I can. And he went, yeah, 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 let's meet for dinner. He cornered me. After dinner, he ended up signing me up for Joseph. Um, luckily, I got paid really well. And I did four shows. But it wasn't about the pay for me. It was about the experience. And it it pelted me out there again it, 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 in a comfortable and safe environment, which was lovely. And I had to wear a wig. <laughs> <laughs> you wore it well. If you can, like, post a picture here. I will. I'm going to, I'm going to, it's coming, like, babe, there, honestly. I'll, there I'll, it I'll, is. Seriously. Beautiful. Um, Nay, what were they thinking? I thought it looked <laughs> I stunning. Didn't burn it. Anyway. Did you not ask to keep it afterwards? <laughs> but I wanted to keep the coat though, it was better than Ken Wright. Oh no, right. But that experience, so obviously the first time you did Joseph in Swindon, I assume your parents and none of your family were able to get there in time because you'd only found out nope. So this You're was the first time they got to see you be Joseph. In their hometown, and your sister was there. So, how was that for and you? One, can I add one more thing? Yeah. I did, the Isle of Wight, the national that year was the national. You'll know this was the national gay pride. Yes. So I was lucky enough to be in the parade. Yes. My massive coat, which was a pride flag. Yeah. Do you know what I mean, it was perfect. And 
my sister with her little dog came and she was pregnant at the time. She just stood there crying. Yeah. And she was like, I can't. And I felt like I am so proud to be home with Conchita first, Danny Beard headlining, and there's me with my coat. Like, <laughs> hey, it was amazing. And to, to, to bring Joseph home and to do it was amazing. And, and for me, I've always said, you can be performing at Warner's and be loving performing and getting paid something for it. You can be performing in the jury lane and getting paid for yeah. it. As long as you love it, that's brilliant. That's amazing. And would you say... So, yeah. If you had to pick one of your most precious memories of being on the stage, would it be one of those? What are your most favourite? Um, Slow Any Dream Will Do with Henry Metcalf. The last time I did it when I yeah. went to Boston. Um, and I, I went back to Joseph and I was lucky enough because they hadn't got George Beat the cover ready yet. I went straight on because Jamie Hensley had planned dates that he couldn't do. Yeah. So I went on and this time my mum and dad got to see me do the Bill Kenwright version and that for me was everything and more yeah. and the slow any dream will do they don't do it in the west end and what the bill kenwright production has is heart and yeah. what what they don't have in Schwarzky crystals they have as heart yeah yeah beautiful so yeah so let's tap into this so i remember seeing you just before you kind of had a bit of a break from the industry, and you were in, you were in good spirits. And this is this is common. Like people don't know what's going on behind people, and you you kind of I think you did a quite a good job of masking it. To be honest, that's what we do as performers. Yeah, that's is that how you, it felt to you? Because, like, say at the time we we're, we're good friends, and I wasn't even aware of what was. Could you remind me when you're talking about? When are you talking about? Just before you went on tour with, I think it was Saturday Night Fever. Or was it? Okay. Okay, cool, yeah. Um, well, when did, when... I don't know how honest to be right. Okay, I'll be honest. Um, yeah, I'll be really honest, but fuck it. Um, I just split up. It, it started, I split up with my boyfriend, um, Alfie. Um, and I just... So and Alfie was somebody that you worked with on Joseph, and that's a yeah, relationship that brother, formed out of that. Yeah, he was my brother in the show. Yeah. And um, sadly it ended, and we were together for two years, and I think I was like, no, I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, yeah. I'm fine, I'm fine. And I wasn't, and my coping mechanism was getting with loads of guys and that was all coming from wanting to be verified yes and wanting attention and wanting to take my clothes off and for someone to go ooh when and to be validated can, to be validated exactly Phil and I think you can relate to yeah. that we've like I say it's not uncommon it's something that I think a lot of people experience and it kind of you just in that situation mm you've got that gratification and it's an instant gratification instant and then it it wears off though and you wake up the next day and you feel guilty and you feel shame or you feel kind of you don't it doesn't satisfy you in the way that it's it should or it's intended to no i completely but it's it's a very dark trap that it's a dark trap and i you know you casting directors people in the industry might be like looking watch this and be like oh god you know no i think it's important I don't, I don't really mind because I know that a lot of people don't talk about it and yeah. I want people to know that I've been there and it's really bad for your mental health. Those next days after it, you feel dirty, you feel disgusting yeah. and I was having no sleep and I, I'll put my hands up and say I was on the Joseph tour, not booking digs and I said this on my story and you know what I'm talking about, yeah. but I, I didn't book digs, I just went on Grindr. Yeah. And that was the start of beginning of a nightmare a living nightmare and that for me I hadn't I couldn't see myself anymore I couldn't see what I was doing I was just rolling into 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 a disaster and 
I didn't have a safe place. I was on tour. I was changing venue all the time. I didn't have my family. I didn't have a home. So home for me was, was when I was on stage. But being on stage was my home and therapy. But everything around that was a mess. Yeah. Everything apart from the show was a mess. And that's when it began. And then... How long did that last, that period? And when did you kind of realise, what changed to make you kind of give you a wake-up call, if if that was the right thing? I didn't have a wake-up call. I I didn't have one, to be honest, Phil. I'll be honest, I didn't have a wake-up call. It just went on and on. (laughs) Um, I I don't want to go on into detail about everything. Um, Let me try and speed it up. I ended up, I did... Saturday Night Fever and I was assistant director to Bill Kenwright he was amazing and my mental health wasn't in a place and I had to leave the job there we go and then that brought me back home and here I still am I'm still at home and it's nearly been a year since I've been at home and it's been the hardest year of my life but it's been healing I ended up in a mental hospital and I wanted to commit I committed I tried to commit suicide uh, four times um and I don't mean to say it's so blasé, but it's my cover, it's my, my mechanism to to make it okay. Yeah. Because if I if I make if I'm like I tried to commit suicide, it's like it makes it into something that's not accessible and not not accessible, but not. I try and normalise it for myself. Yeah. Because it's like okay, this happened. I got through it. I'm not going to be like I committed suicide. This is it. Like oh my god. Um, I want to be like, I commit suicide, but I know loads of people, I tried to commit suicide, but I know loads of people that have been in that position. I'm not alone, and you aren't alone as well as people out there. And the amount of people that reached out to me when I told my story on Instagram yeah. was outstanding. Well, not only, it, it, it extended further than that. So obviously people knew that you and I were good friends, and people reached out to me and said, did you know this about Jamie? And I was like, I knew bits. I'll be honest, I didn't know to the full extent. Because that is something that was private to you. And that was something that you did, like I say, mask or deal with in your own way. Or kind of keep to yourself. And it was it was very exposing. And it was, it was very brave. And it was kind of necessary. Like I say, it's kind of exposing yourself like I've had it and we both know like during this whole lockdown experience there's been a couple of times that I've wavered I saw it on your Facebook yeah and you kind of think and the the best feedback I got from because you do you at the time I was like well part of my blog is showing who I am and being honest and being truthful I was like at those moments that was my truth and it was kind of being prepared to show your vulnerability, to try yeah. and normalise it, like you say, and to realise that we don't have this Instagram filter on all the time. And that behind it, we are just people and we do have issues. And I think for me, the, it, it was empowering to kind of put expose myself in that kind of way and to get, like you say, that recognition and that feedback. It was like, because it, it's, it's scary, isn't it? To, like, speak up and speak out and think, am I going to be seen... You, nobody likes to be seen as a vulnerable person, but vulnerability is so powerful. And, like, expressing it and connecting with people is beautiful. And I think that is exactly what you did in that series of Instagram I, stories. Thank you. I, I really... I don't know. I, I didn't think about it when I was no. doing it. Like, I didn't think about what I was doing, which for me, do I regret it? I don't regret it. I don't regret putting it out there. But for myself, I have to be honest, after I put it out there, I went backwards a little yeah. bit and I, I was doing better and I put my hands up. You would have seen it on my social media if you follow me that I, I went quiet yeah. after it all because it was like, whoa. It was, I had Carrie Ellis talking to me about it. I had 
Amy Hart from Love Island, you know, I, I was like, I, I'm just Jamie who's done Joseph a thousand times, you know, I, I had, you know, Faye Brooks reach out to me, Joe Prenger, it was, it was, you know, but it was more, not those people, and they're wonderful, but it yeah. was people's stories that, that, that reached out to me, they're amazing, and they've got profiles that can help these courses, which is great, but it was the people like me that, were hurting yeah. and trying to hold on to a career that I wouldn't say per se my mental health suffered because of my career, but I would say mixing my mental health with my career and trying to cope with that is just not going to happen because I had no stability and in life you have to have some foundation of stability and we are all struggling and and i had so many people reach out to me god bless them all and i suddenly felt like i had a million friends that 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 that, that were on the same page as me that i had no idea that they were going through that i said oh my god why why you talk to me and then i was like well why would they talk i haven't been talking to them so the amount of people that reached out to me was phenomenal, um, and it, but but it did. It, I I went back. I went way back. So so then after that, how did how did you pull it back round? How did it change? I have no idea. Um, I'll say one word, and that's lockdown. Yeah, that's it. It it. I was supposed to go on a cruise. If I I wouldn't have been ready. Um, yeah. I was supposed to do these I was supposed to do a show on the island I was supposed to do a concert with Joseph I did a rehearsal I didn't know any of the words of songs I, I've known for years and that that's me being true and that's I'm not even being comedic when I say that yeah. it, I couldn't think I, I didn't know the timings of music my head was that's what mental health can do to you my head was everywhere um, and lockdown wasn't was, I hate talking about it like this because it's so bad because COVID-19 is terrible. I'm not taking that away, but for me personally, it saved my situation and gave yeah. me time to breathe. And I've had so many performers because, and you know, I'm honest, I'm like, I went, I, went, I was sat out in the garden the other day and I said, guys, do you think lockdown has kind of given you a bit of chance to breathe? And the amount of performers that are like, yes. Yes. <laughs> It has. It's pushed this massive reset button, which I think we all needed it. Like I needed it. I'll be honest. Like I was, I was living in London, seeing, and I don't begrudge it. I was seeing so many shows. It was brilliant, but it was exhausting and it was tiring. And it's, it does. It impacts you in ways that you don't really kind of stop and gather. Um, yeah, and, and the thing is, the thing is, Phil. I went off theatre. I'll put my hands up. Please yeah. don't judge me, Paul Taylor Mills. Please don't judge, <laughs> judge me, Danielle Sorrento. But I, I just, I just was like, I don't have money. I, it's my work or my days off. Don't want to see it. But I always knew I had the choice that I could. And I went to see Six and loved it and saw Millie O'Connell and was like, oh, it's amazing. But when you can't see it and you don't have the choice to, it's like, whoa, 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 whoa now this is weird um and i know there are more important things in life to get along but it's things that sustain your mental health yeah so i i really miss it i really miss theatre do you so yeah i really miss it but it's given me my love for theatre back missing it yeah that feeling it's like I want to see Hamilton. I want to see, like, I haven't seen it. I haven't seen Derriman. I haven't seen anything. Yeah. I haven't even seen Come From Away. So let's talk <laughs> about something else you did recently. A little Channel 4 show. Let <laughs> me get something. So again, this was something that I knew you were doing before don't, you did it. Don't say, don't say what it is yet. Well, I think don't everybody knows because everybody saw the... <laughs> Is that what they give you? Is that all you got to take home? And they gave me it. Someone gave me it on set as a joke. They're that like, is hilarious. Oh, we had them in the, um, I had it in my hotel. I had that. So I took it with me. So this is Love I, uh, sorry, what's it called? First Dates Hotel. 
Love Island. Love Island. Oh, don't say that. Edit that out. No, so this was First Dates Hotel, which is a spin-off of the original series set in a restaurant. And this, yeah. is this the first series that they've done? No, I think it's like the fourth or Okay. Third. So they kind of, like, they transplanted into, like, a location in Italy. And they kind in of... In Naples. So what made you... How did it come about? What made you decide to do it? I think I split up with Alfie. Yeah. And I was just like, F it. I was just like, fuck it. Do you mind if I play with my hair? No, go for um, it. So did they approach yeah. you? How did, did they get in touch? Or no, did you apply? No, but I saw something on it. And, um... And had you watched the series? What? Had you I watched the series? Oh, God, yeah. I loved it. And my sister's obsessed with it. But... I, I saw an advert and I was just, someone sent it to me I can't remember who it was the first date so I was like oh yeah I'll do it this is quite a while ago I can't remember when and I heard I think I got through like a couple of rounds and then I missed the call and they kind of just gave up on me and I was like oh. and I was still on their books and they what did they do they contacted me when I was last in Joseph yeah 2019 and they said it was weird. It was meant to be because we had we didn't sell two venues, so we um, I had two three weeks off randomly, and then they called me and were like, "Hi, we'd like to audition you for the first dates." And I was like, "Great!" Literally had an interview, had another interview, had a psychiatric interview. I don't know how fast that. <laughs> um, I had like all these forms, and I had to meet this guy, and then. Oh, go to the studio, do Zumba, you know, on 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 film, and it was mad, and and I, and I got it. I, I got I got through. I was in the original cast of First Date Series Four, so yeah. And so, like you say, it was just a bit of fun. You didn't really take it too seriously. Were you? Or were you? Were you looking for love? Is that what kind of motivated you to do it? Yes. Oh. And I I mean that because I. Because, like, me and you, like, Joe Blogs will be like, oh, my God, Duncan James, like, oh, my God. Whereas I'll see Duncan James and I'll be like, brilliant. I'm like, chances are I could be in Joseph with him and yeah. I'll probably work with him. I don't, I don't have, a, I've never been a fan girl of anyone. I, I see us all the same. Yeah. But, so, you know, I wasn't, like, fanning over the fact that I was going to be on first dates and meet Fred, as lovely as he is. Um, it was more... I wanted to... I wanted a holiday. Yeah. I'm not going to lie. Yeah. Lie, <laughs> and it was a gorgeous location. So how, how was it... So they just whisked you off, and you... Yeah, yeah they, I mean, obviously, don't give us too much information, because it's, not be, it's on in about four weeks, isn't it, your episode? So we know you're going to be on it because you you popped up in the first episode, and you're going to be twenty eighth of twenty eighth of May. Yeah. On the ninth PM. Yeah. So don't tell us what happens or what is going, but was it what you expected? No, how I'll how was it? Process. So you you fly out on my own, and then it's like secret. Like they they have separate cars, they have separate teams that deal with one side of the couple and then the other side of the couple have to stay at a separate hotel now you don't go straight into the hotel you're you're in a separate hotel the night before so your prospective partner is in Alicante or wherever somewhere different and you're like there so I was in a different hotel and the next day you get you get it but it's like mental like the timings are like okay Jamie can leave now to do some filming no, the other guy, your boyfriend, or not your boyfriend, but the, the yeah, perspective the partner. Date. No, he can't because Jamie's outside, and it's all yeah, it's funny. Amazing. It seems a bit like cause I, so. I've worked in TV, so I know how it all operates. But was it because this is a new experience for you? Was it exciting to be in that situation? <sighs> Loved it. Yeah. I, I don't, don't don't get me wrong. Like, I'd always been intrigued by yeah. 
reality TV and my parents are so anti that that I think it made me more intrigued by it and I just love it I love X Factor I love I'm a celebrity dancing on ice you know whatever um and first dates were something that I think nurtured you and actually looked after the person as much as you could I ended up learning that any TV reality TV is exposing and for your mental health it's not great yeah but as far as reality TV shows go that's the one you want to do <clears throat> yeah so then yeah so then go back to more recent times so you, you're back on the island you're still with your parents your mental health is improving and you decide during the lockdown to do to launch your own business yeah how did this come about what inspired it I've got a really good story. Yeah. Um, I don't think he'll mind me saying, but my friend Mikey Heath was just having a bit of a sad time. Like, he was just feeling a bit low. He was in Joseph with me and just wanting to, 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 to keep busy. And I reached out to him and I was like, mate, and he'd done a workshop. So originally I had something called Jamie's Workshops. The concept was there. It was great but I was rubbish with money. My business concept was zero. It didn't go down the pan, but I just carried on with Joseph. It was great. I had Millie O'Connell on first for second street. It was bringing workshops to the island, but it kind of, I, I kind of took a back seat with that, but I had the idea there. And I just forgot about it really and, and what got on with have a mental health or whatever. And then my friend Mikey was just like, I'm really down. I was like, mate, I was like, I've got this idea because me and my mum, I do Zumba and dance fitness with my mum on Zoom. So we were discovering Zoom and I become obsessed with things. So I became obsessed with Zoom. I was obsessed. I have three accounts, ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, I know. Um, so I discovered everything. I discovered like the best sound, the best, the best everything. And just one day, my friend was like, oh, Mike's really down. And I went, I'm going to call him now, right now. I was walking the dog down the beach and I said to my dad, I've just had an idea and I haven't really seen it. I'd seen snippets of people yeah. doing it, but I hadn't seen it on a scale. I thought, I've got to do this. There's something here. There is something. And I phoned him and he went, yeah, baby, let's do it. And it was just one workshop, just promoted it myself. And it, we had like 20 people and we, you know, and I just got him some money from it, and it was the greatest showman. Along the way, my friend Sophie Tarani, who is uh, an ex-cruise director, and she, her agent is um, Zoe from Any Dream Will Do. What's her name? Zoe Tyler. Yeah. Um, she is now a guest in on a ship, which is an amazing job. But she was a cruise director, and she went to GSA with me, and she is a businesswoman, and. With my contacts, with my flair of the theatre and love for the theatre and love of kids and her business mind, we collaborated, we had a chat, and here I am today. And I don't know what's happened. I have no idea what's going on. And is it exciting yeah. to start a new project? Has it helped you to kind of focus and... Massively. A, a million percent, Phil. I, I can't... You, you, you hit the nail on the head. It's it's waking up and having purpose. And for yeah. the last year, I've woken up and thought, you know what? I'd rather go back to sleep and, and, and probably not be here right now. But I wake up and I'm like, yes! Like, oh my God, it's the Hamilton! I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm doing waving through a window, TikToks, and I'm going crazy. Like, And of course, I know I need to be careful. I know... The down times are dangerous, but the happy hyper times are even more dangerous for your mental health. Yeah. They yeah. are when you do naughty things. And that is when my therapist comes into action and tells me, Jamie, slow down, breathe, you're going to be okay. Yeah. It's yeah. And so how many have you done? Of, so you did... See, so Mikey started them off. Yeah. And you've had Jodie Steele. Jodie Steele started us off with six. 
And how was I that? How did that go down? I do you have like seventy people <laughs> log in? We had seventy people. We had seventy people for our first one. Um I just had loads of brain waves that was like, This isn't just a workshop business. This is a scenario where I I could have host a workshop worldwide and people in America can do my workshop and I was like hang on a minute this is kind of cool and there are people in America that don't get a chance to meet Jodie Steele but yeah. they know of her and I didn't realise Jodie Steele had such a big following wow and I just I timing wise I just got hooked on TikTok this is another part of my story that's interesting because I was like oh TikTok that like, TikTok loves musicals. They love Hamilton. They love Beetlejuice. They love Heathers and they love Six. They are the four and Dear Evan Hansen. They're the five musicals. That's cult. They have millions of girls. But Heathers and our version especially, they love. So I had the idea that Jodie posted a video of her... With Liam, yeah. Um, ...doing Six. And she posted it and, and we've had people from America saying, what is Jodie still doing on your TikTok? Can I book in for your workshop? And I said, yeah. <laughs> and that's, that's that. So we've got people from America. That's not me being a big head. That's me wanting to get access for those people to, to, to have something while they're bloody at home, doing nothing. And who have you got coming up then? Who have we got exciting people to look forward to? So Jodie's doing How another one, isn't got? she? So Jodie's doing with, with Liam, yeah, isn't Jody, she? Jodie's like, she's done Heathers and she's doing a Wicked with Liam Doyle. Yeah, that'll be a good one. A joint one. Um, so ones I'm really proud of is I've got Chad Harris. He did actually play Ola. Yeah. And, um, Frozen and he played Damien in Mean Girls on Broadway and he is doing a masterclass. Um, I also have someone from the ensemble of the Broadway musical Frozen and he is coming to do one at the end of May, a dance workshop. Um, and a new exciting one I got today is the one, the only, Sam Salter and he's doing a Sam Salter masterclass which will be incredible. So tell me, so what what do they get out of this experience? So how much does it cost? It costs five pounds, which is brilliant. Isn't that? That's ridiculous. Because obviously money is tight and people are perhaps, and there's so much available now, and there's so much content out there and people doing different classes. But five pounds seems very reasonable to get a class with a West End performer. And then within that, so they get... What? How? How is each class structured? So I like to say to them, "Can you please warm up before it, so we can crack on?" Because the workshops are an hour. We're working with a lot of younger kids. We want to have their attention yeah. for the moment it starts. So the structure is a five-minute warm-up, crack on, do a simple—I mean, simple—routine, no thrills and spills, then get to about um, 45 minutes in, maybe 50, and then do a Q&A, which is interactive. Now on Zoom, you can type any questions you have. So whilst people are being admitted into Zoom, people can type, and then Jody Steele at the end will be like, question from da 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 I'll unmute that person, and we can have a chat about the question you just asked me. Wow. One hour, finished, lovely. Ah, oh, that's brilliant. So they're getting to engage with these performers. A five pound. Exactly. In a way that, like, you don't get over Instagram stories or over FaceTime Live. This is some... Uh, the interactive side is... is incredible. Yeah. And how... Uh, when you've watched this happening and working, how does it feel for you to think that you've put this together? I'm very, I'm very much like this is a team, yeah. and I just felt proud, and I just to see there's something about Zoom 
if you haven't used Zoom, just do it because to see these faces popping up and, and they're using it for the singing things, the COVID yeah. concert and different, or they're not using Zoom, but they're boxing people's faces and putting them all in heart. Oh, there's just something special about it that I can't, I don't know. I don't know why, but it's cute. It just makes me feel like, oh God, I've got, you know, to, I had a 65 year old there and I had, two people dressed as cats because they come from Cats Comic Con Zoom earlier in the day there. I had lovely Lottie Payne, who's one of my students, who is basically a prima ballerina, giving her full-on Joseph. And I had Jodie Steele's, like, one of her clients at JSA come in to do all of my workshops because she's having a wonderful time and it's fiver and she put on her Facebook today I booked five workshops my dad's broke but I'm having a lovely time <laughs> um, so you know what 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 can you do I'm just uh, my granddad is a businessman he is the manager of Kate Bush Bob Geldof and um, and many big artists. He's a, he's a massive businessman and he was a music manager. And he has really contributed to this. And also Darren Brown has, may I just say. Um, and he has really helped me. And, and the one pearl of wisdom he gave me, and he is a massive businessman and I didn't expect this from him. He said, as long as you keep the fun, you're winning. The moment you lose the fun, is when it goes into something else. Amazing. And it's something it shouldn't be. And that is the pearl of wisdom. I wake up every day and I'm like, yeah, because if I try and project this on you, like, buy a ticket, book it, yeah, buy a, you know, I am projecting it a lot of the time and I, I know I do, but I'm projecting in a way like, come on, guys, join me. Join me because I'm up for it and... I'm putting myself out there. I'm making myself look stupid, but that's what we're going to do on Zoom. So if I'm making myself look stupid on Insta Live, come and do that with me and we'll have a laugh. Sounds incredible. Oh. Well, good luck with it all. I'll be, uh, I might pop into one or two of them. I don't know yet. We'll see. I was thinking you haven't been to what yet. I'm so lazy. Like, I'm literally enjoying just eating my Easter eggs and just watching Netflix. I've not quite got on board you with the are whole so cute. fitness you thing are yet. So cute. I mean, I'm. This I... boy used to send me videos of him with bloody Elsa Teddy's singing. Right. <laughs> I think we went into the Disney store in Stratford after a Nando's when I was living with you for a week. Yeah. When you lived in Leighton, and you were just you were I don't know you were sending me videos of you with Elsa or something like Christ. I love it. I've not changed. <laughs> Thirty eight years old and I'm still obsessed with Olaf. So maybe I'll right. do maybe I'll do the Olaf workshop. Maybe I'll come for maybe that. You can interview him. Maybe you can interview him. Although I, I might I might break. do your your Joseph class. That was today, babe. <laughs> well anyway I might just go and watch it back <laughs> well, it's, it's been a pleasure talking to you Jamie you know what it's actually you know what I was worried about it talking about my truth but I think because it's now mixed, when I was talking about my truth the last time, it's like, I'm still in it, and I'm depressed, and this awful thing happened, and I'm yeah. still right out of it. But now, I feel the furthest I feel from that dark place, so I feel I can talk about it yeah. in a way that's not going to send me back. I think, and I think so thank you. what you'll be surprised at is how many people will and do relate. Because we, we have all been there, and we've all done stuff, and been in those situations... But we've not all got the the platform, and that's what I do with my blog. That's why I do encourage people to talk about it. And I'm the same as you. I get messages from people, kind of. And it is, yeah, you're a great guy, honestly. You're, you're, can I just? You're doing a great job, and I love all the stuff you've done with George Hankers and all yeah. of that. And I just think it's so relevant. And 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 you were one of the only people that said on my story when I. The people were really supportive of my mental health. But when I went in my, into my story about like being gay and 
going grant no one kind of appreciated that <laughs> you were the only person that went actually i really like those kind of things to so carry it on so yeah you know anyway right go get your chores done i will and phil this has been amazing stay home stay safe and stay zooming <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>